In the last few videos, we've been looking at integrability, specifically Riemann integrability, and we want to look at a couple properties of the Riemann integral in this video. But before we do that, let's recall a couple of things. So a function from the interval a, b to r is Riemann integrable if and only if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is a partition p epsilon of the interval a, b such that the upper sum of f on that partition minus the lower sum of f on that partition is less than epsilon. And so here I want to point out that the definition of Riemann integrability is equivalent to this statement involving epsilons and this partition. Now the definition of Riemann integrability is given by this down here, and I haven't defined all the parts here. I'll let you guys look at previous videos if you need to do that. So f is Riemann integrable if and only if, sorry, if the upper integral uf is equal to the lower integral and in that case we say that it's equal to the integral and we write it in this like standard calculus notation. Okay so the first thing that we're going to prove goes like this. So let's suppose that f from a b to r is bounded and c is some point between a and b. Then the result is that f is integrable on the interval a, b, if and only if it's integrable on a, c, and c, b. And then in that case, we have the following rule um, involving all of the involved integrals. So the integral from a to b of f is equal to the integral from a to c of f plus the integral from c to b of f. So that is also familiar from pro probably a calculus class. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement, which means we need to prove two directions. Let's go ahead and start with the forward direction. So in other words, what we'll do is suppose that f is bounded on a, b, and integrable. And I should say, whenever I say integrable, um, I mean Riemann integrable because that's the only type of integral we're talking about at the moment. So on the interval a, b. And then what we want to do here is show that it's also integrable on a, c, and c, b. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Now we'll use this classification of integrability using the epsilon and the partition. So let's say that we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take p, a partition of our larger interval a, b, such that the upper sum of f on that partition minus the lower sum of f on that partition is less than epsilon. So again, that's possible by this classification which we proved in a previous video. Okay, great. So now the next thing that we wanna do is define a new partition of a, b that includes this number c. So c may be in this partition, but it may not be in this partition. But either way, it doesn't hurt to like add it in again because you know if you take a union of sets that already include some elements, well, that's not adding any new elements. So we'll call it p naught, and this is gonna be equal to p union this singleton c. And then next, we'll use that to construct two partitions, one of this lower subinterval and one of this upper subinterval. So I'll call those P1 and P2. So P1 is going to be P naught intersected with A to C, and P2 is going to be P naught intersected with um, B to, sorry, C to B. And then next I wanna notice that P naught is a very, very simple refinement of P. So that tells us that U F P naught minus L F P naught is less than epsilon. Again, by something we proved earlier that relates upper sums, lower sums, and refinements of partitions. So I'll let you guys check that, but that's actually a pretty easy jump. Then next what we want to do is decompose this upper sum on P naught and this lower sum on P naught into upper and lower sums on P1 and 2. So I'll decompose this one into UF P1 plus UF P2. Okay, good. And that's just because, well, 
sort of obviously P naught is the disjoint union of P1 and P2. So by the definition of the upper and lower sum, this decomposition is pretty clear. And so, and then we're gonna have minus the lower sum of F on P1 plus the lower sum of F on P2. And all of that is less than epsilon like this. Now we can like combine like terms. And what I mean by like terms are parts considering the partition P1 and then parts considering the partition P2. So that's gonna give us these two quantities. So we'll have UF P1 minus LF P1. So that's the upper sum of F on P1 minus the lower sum of F on P1. And then to that, we are going to add the upper sum of F on P2 minus the lower sum of F on P2. So again, I've just decomposed this thing up here into like parts, but that means all of that is still less than epsilon. <clears throat> but now, again, by a previous result, we know that the upper sum is always larger than the lower sum. So what that tells us that each of these guys is going to be bigger than zero but since each of these guys are bigger than zero and their sum is less than epsilon, that means each of these guys is actually less than epsilon. But now this one being less than epsilon gives us integrability on A comma C because P1 is a partition of A comma C. But then this one being less than epsilon um, tells us that we have integrability on CB, again, because P2 is a partition of CB. Okay, so we've done this forward direction, so now let's get to the reverse direction. Okay, now we're ready for the reverse direction. So let's suppose that F is integrable on AC and CB, and our goal is to show that it's integrable on A, B. And again, we'll use this classification of Riemann integrability over here. So let's say that we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take P1, which is a partition of AC, and P2, which is a partition of CB, such that, so we'll have UF P1 minus LF P1 is less than epsilon over two, so again, by the integrability on A comma C, we can make that as small as we want. How small do we want to make it? Well, epsilon over two. You can probably see where this is going. We're going to add two things together and get epsilon over two plus epsilon over two is epsilon. And then furthermore, we've chosen P2 so that UF P2 minus LF P2 is less than epsilon over two as well. Great, now we just add these two inequalities and we'll get the following setup. So we'll have UF P1 um, plus UF P2 like that, and then minus LF P1 plus LF P2 is less than epsilon. Great. But now, next, we wanna notice that P1 union P2 is gonna be a partition of A comma B. And furthermore, this guy right here, because the overlap is only happening in an endpoint, is in fact the upper sum of F on P1 union P2. And similarly, this is the lower sum of F on P1 union P2. So let's see what we've got. We found a partition of A comma B, that is P1 union P2, that when we take the difference of the upper sum and the lower sum, we get something that is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so now we've done both directions of this. Now we just need to fill in that box. Okay, we just established the if and only if statement. Now we're gonna establish this box. And I'm actually only gonna do half of it because the other half of the argument is pretty similar and would make a really good exercise. Okay, so let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Let's first take P, 
which is a partition of our large interval a b such that we have u f p minus l f p is less than epsilon so again we're assuming we've got integrability on all of these intervals so this is something that we can do but now notice that this means that u f p is less than l f p plus epsilon so that's just by like simple arithmetic. Okay, now next we're gonna follow a similar strategy to what we did in the first half of the proof, and that is set P naught equal to P union, this element C, which is on the open interval. And then from there, we'll set P one equal to P naught intersect AC, and P two equal to P naught intersect C, B, just, did we, just as we had done before. And now we're gonna jump into the meat of this calculation. So let's start over here with the integral from A to B of F. So we know that exists from like our earlier discussion. That's equal to the upper integral of F on that interval. Again, by the definition of integrability, but now that is going to be less than or equal to the upper sum of F on the partition P. Because remember, the upper integral is the infimum over all such upper sums. But now that's going to be less than the lower sum of f on that partition p plus epsilon from this inequality that we had right here. Okay, cool. But now that is going to be less than the lower, or maybe we should say less than or equal to the lower sum of f on uh, p1 plus the lower sum of f on p2 plus epsilon. And the inequality is because we're working through this refinement of p given by p naught. And then we're essentially splitting p naught into these two pieces. But now notice that this is going to be less than or equal to the lower integral of f on the interval a comma c. So I'll put a little subscript there for the integral a comma c because this is not the lower sum on the whole thing. And then plus the lower integral of f on this interval b comma c. So again, I'll put the interval down there because we know that um, that's where it's coming from. And then plus epsilon, great. But then the lower integral is equal to the upper integral, which is equal to the whole integral because we have assumed integrability on these two intervals. So that means that this is equal to the integral on a to c of f plus the integral from c to b of f plus epsilon. So let's see what we've got going on here. So we've got this integral over a, b is less than the integral over a to c plus the integral from c to b plus epsilon. And that epsilon is arbitrary. And now this is where I'm gonna stop it so that you guys have a little bit of an exercise to do. You can do a very, very similar inequality to get this going in the other direction, but then make an argument that since this epsilon is arbitrary, you have these two quantities are actually the same. Okay, that's a good place to stop.